As I mentioned, what I want to talk to you during this Lenten season is the King. This morning's Gospel is intentionally focusing on the Second Coming. I want to shift that and I want to talk about the first coming. But I want to do it in the context of what Luke says, the Son of Man is coming. So with that in mind, let me turn, and if you have your Bibles, turn to Daniel and turn to chapter 7. In the book of Daniel. Now it should be familiar since A, we have just gone over Daniel in Sunday school. RC talked about it last week. Uh, yeah, last week. Matter of fact. So some of this shouldn't be too unfamiliar. But I want to just bracket this morning a little bit. Notice what Luke says in this morning's gospel, the signs in the sky, the sun and the moon and the stars, and upon the earth there will be distress of the nations, perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, there is turmoil on the earth, men's hearts are failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which after coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So Luke is describing, obviously, some cataclysmic events. Now, allow me this morning to read a section from Daniel, and I want to begin with Daniel chapter uh, Daniel verse 6 I'm um, sorry no let's start with uh, Daniel verse let's just start at the beginning in the first year of Belshazzar king of Babylon Daniel had a dream and vision of his head while on his bed then he wrote down the dream telling the main facts Daniel spoke saying I saw in my vision by night and behold the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from, a, from the other. The first was like a lion and had an eagle's head. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly a second beast, like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, there was another like a leopard which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. 
I watched then because the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking, I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. And may God bless the reading of his word. So we see that Daniel places Luke's son of man in the presence and the context, not only of the judgment of nations, but in the presence of the Ancient of Days. Now, we don't need to go over, you know, what all the nations were, you know, the, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, etc. We know, we know what, the, what the beasts represent. But one of the things that we usually overlook is that the Son of Man has a very specific meaning. It is not a juxtaposition. It's not a counterpoint. It is not the opposite of the Son of God, as if each represents a different characteristic or element of Christ's nature, one divine, one human. That is not what's being discussed. From the previous verses in Daniel, it's clearly seen that the Son of God, in his appearance, is heavenly. But Daniel was at a loss for words to describe this son, I'm sorry, son of man, this heaven. And Daniel was at a loss for words to describe the son of man. So he appeals to the image of someone kind of like a human. As we see here, the son of man is a representative figure. Now notice something specific about this chapter of what we have read in Daniel. We see an amalgamation of beasts, human, animal, multiple animals, all of them hideous and all of them unclean according to Jewish law, each depicting one of the fallen sinful empires of the earth. one like the Son of Man represents a legitimately human kingdom. There's no mixture. There's no corruption in him. The representation of the kingdom of Israel, of God's chosen people and all the saints on high. And all of these saints to whom this Son of Man comes are being oppressed by all of these nations. This force, this oppressive force of these sinful beasts ravaging the earth, capturing the people of God. However, the Son of Man arrives. And he arrives displayed and described with transcendent and divine qualities. Notice how Daniel depicts him. He rides the cloud, depicting the chariot of the divine warrior. And you have heard me talk about the meaning of the divine cloud, the glory cloud, the heavenly court, the throne of God, his movable chariot across the sky. You heard R.C. talk about it last week as well. Psalm 104.3 says, Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters? Who maketh the clouds his chariot? 
who walketh upon the wings of the wind, who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. This is an awesome sight of an awesome individual with divine prerogatives. He's a royal being as he is presented before the throne of the Ancient of Days. In other words, he stands in front of, face to face with Yahweh. Yahweh, the Ancient of Days, gives the Son of Man dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. When Jesus speaks of himself as the Son of Man, and mark this, there are many titles in the New Testament for Jesus. There is Lord, there is Christ, there is Son of God, but the title by which Jesus referred to himself most frequently is the Son of Man. And when Jesus speaks of himself in that context, he is evoking an image that bears with it a picture of the conflict between the divine and earthly kingdoms, a picture of the conflict between divine kingship and earthly kingship, a picture of the conflict between redemption, rescue, salvation, and the slavery to sin captivity to oppression. Even the temptation of Jesus by Satan in Matthew 4 is one of the proclamation of competing, contrasting kingdoms. That of sin and Satan on earth, that of the presence and future fulfillment of the kingdom of God. Jesus, in the three synoptic Gospels, identifies himself as the one who seeks Israel's deliverance, and by extension, the deliverance of his people. Matthew 10, 6, but go, when he speaks to his disciples to go and evangelize, but go rather, not to the world, but go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 15, when questioned, Jesus said, Hey, I am not sent to anyone but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And in the section just before this morning's gospel, Luke 19, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus describes himself or identifies himself as the one who suffers Israel's exilic death and vindication. And by extension, the exilic, the exilic death and vindication of his people. Mark 10, 45. <coughs> for the Son of Man has come as a ransom for many. And just as the nation of Israel, God's Son, his chosen people, were exiled and separated from God in the Old Testament, to be redeemed and restored once again by God's sovereign working in his mediators, Ezra the priest, Nehemiah the prophet, so too Christ as prophet, priest, and king will sovereignly redeem his people from their bondage, sin, and their separation from God by his death, resurrection, and ascension. And Jesus also identifies himself as the one who is exalted and possesses universal sovereignty. And you can see that in Mark 10, uh, Mark 14, 25. 
Each of these elements finds its foundation, its root, if you will, in Daniel chapter 7 and the prophet's vision of one like the Son of Man. This is a divine, this is a transcendent, sovereign, glorious, eternal image appropriated and applied by Jesus to himself. When we come to Advent, last week we saw that there was peace that was brought, or is brought, by the king. This week we see that the king brings with him a new kingdom. That new kingdom is a kingdom of freedom. That new kingdom is a kingdom of release. That new kingdom is a kingdom of joy because of redemption. What is the joy to the world when we sing that hymn? It's that this king has come. And he has come to bring his kingdom. A kingdom which destroys the sinful kingdoms of the world. A kingdom which brings you out of the exile of the oppression of this sinful time the kingdom in which you live now, this sinful world, and this birth, this coming, brings you into a new kingdom. The advent and the anticipation of that future kingdom, mind you, The advent and the anticipation of that future kingdom comes with the birth of Christ now in Christ. In him, all of these things are real. It all occurs now in him here. The physical manifestation of this, where the rest of the world will suddenly bow to him, will come later. But for you, for those in the kingdom, for those who come at this time to celebrate the arrival of the king, you celebrate all of that which the king brings with him. Listen to the last verse I want to read in Daniel. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. There will never be another exile. There will never be oppression. There will never be another cosmic battle with sin. Because the kingdom comes with the promise of eternal forgiveness freedom from that sin. Advent, this second week in Advent, is where we see the king who brings peace brings that peace because it is a part of the kingdom that he is bringing.